The world's developed economies are in deep trouble, but here is the really frightening thing. It could get much, much worse. If the Eurozone unravels, no country will be insulated from the consequences. And even if it doesn't, we may be in the midst of a decade-long contraction. My guest today is one of America's most influential economic analysts and investors, Mohamed El Arian. He's CEO of PIMCO, which manages more than a trillion dollars of other people's money. What's the best way out of the mess we're in? Mohamed El Arian in California, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you very much. You are one of the most prominent, most respected fund managers in the United States of America. Right now, do you feel under more pressure than you've ever felt before? I feel more worried and more scared, not just as a fund manager, but as a father. Every day when, when I kiss my daughter goodbye in the morning, she's eight years old, I wonder what world is she going to inherit given the headwinds that we are facing at, at the level of countries, at the level of regions, and at the level of the global economy as a whole. So I would say I'm worried as a fund manager, but I'm even more worried as a parent. Well, I find that a fascinating answer, and you've already introduced the idea that we need to talk about what's happening in the world today at various levels, from short to mid to long term. And I want to do that in this interview, but let me, if I may, just start with the short term. Right now, would you agree with me that it looks like almost nothing uh, that we've assumed to be safe can be taken to be safe? I'm thinking about sovereign debt. I'm thinking about the currencies we use. I'm thinking about the biggest banks in the world. What is safe? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, the global economy has lost many anchors. Not all of them, but has lost many anchors. We've certainly lost our economic anchor. We've lost our financial anchor, and we're losing our social anchor. So there's a sense of uncertainty. People are unsettled because they don't know what is now a parameter, something that you can assume is safe and constant, and what is a variable, something that fluctuates wildly. So that's absolutely right. This feeling of what is safe is very, very um, broad, and it speaks to why even people who can spend money today, people with healthy balance sheet, are saying no thank you, they're going back to the sideline and just waiting. And if we bring it to real specifics, let's go to the Eurozone uh, first of all. Um, right now, do you think that we are close to the sort of fear-driven freeze of financial markets because of what is happening in the Eurozone, the fear that the Eurozone itself will unravel, that we saw in, in the autumn of 2008? Yes, we are, and that has prompted this week central banks to come in in a very coordinated fashion because they are worried as well. Now, why do I say that? First, we are seeing the functioning of markets starting to be problematic. This is like the oil in your car. You don't think about the oil in your car very often, but you realize that if something goes wrong with the oil, the rest of the car will not function. And what we're seeing is the markets themselves, the pipes, that connect different parts of the global economy are starting to get clogged. Second issue, we see an inability of policymakers to catch up with the crisis, let alone get ahead of it. And therefore, it's getting worse and worse. Third, the banks are again fragile. And once you put the banking system in play, lots of people are going to simply step back and stop interacting, including banks stopping to interact with each other. So put all these things together, the next few days and weeks are absolutely critical if we are to avoid a major economic downturn, if we are to avoid a major increase in unemployment, and if we are to avoid a major increase in wealth and income inequality. You say the next few days and weeks are crucial. We've just seen the US Federal Reserve acting with other major central bank players around the world from of course the ECB but the UK, Japan, Canada and uh, the Swiss as well uh, saying that they will do what is necessary to introduce new liquidity. Um, is that going to work? Well it's important. So introducing liquidity buys you some time and the hope is that the central banks are moving because they feel confident that the other agencies which have been basically asleep at the wheel the other agencies are going to move. And these other agencies are particularly in Europe, 
and it's in the run-up to the December 9th summit where major decisions have to be taken. So the hope, and I stress it's a hope, the hope is that the central banks are providing a bridge to somewhere. The fear is that it will be yet another bridge to nowhere. And that's been the story for the last two years, lots of bridges by lots of central banks, but there have been bridges to nowhere because other actors have not stepped up and done what they need to do. You uh, and your company matter because you manage well over a trillion dollars of, of other people's money. I just wonder whether right now you're saying to your clients that you are, that you've lost faith in the euro and that you're moving whatever investments you had denominated in euros out of euros as quick as you can. What we're telling our clients is this is the time to be generally defensive and selectively offensive. And the reason why we're telling them that is because there is a lot of uncertainty out there. And therefore, it's better to have what we call optionality. It's better to have cash in order to be able to move. You don't want to be stuck offside, caught offside, when the world is changing so much. In terms of what Europe can do, yes, we are worried. We feel that Europe faces both an engineering challenge and a political challenge. The U.S. faces mainly a political challenge. Europe has both an engineering challenge and a political challenge. Engineering a solution that satisfies people with very different initial conditions is hard. And we have two Europes, not one. We have a strong Germany that has been doing well and that believes that it has the right answer. And we have weak peripherals that are facing enormous economic and social headwinds. That leads to the political problem, is how do you get agreement among such different countries on what has to be a very difficult decision on what the Eurozone needs to look like to be stronger. So we need to keep an eye on Europe. Europe is really important systemically. And hopefully, I say hopefully, the Europeans will finally get the act together. Yeah, but people like you don't in the end deal in hope, do you? You, you deal in, in what you believe to be probabilities and realities. And I just wonder, you know, we've seen uh, Tim Geithner, the US Treasury Secretary, we've seen Barack Obama send a message to Europe for week upon week upon week of get your act together. And it's a message, I think, that is directed primarily to Angela Merkel. The, the, the decision being that it's only Germany in the end that has the economic power to rescue the Eurozone in its current form. Do you believe the Germans are prepared to do what's necessary? First, I think it's, it's much more than the Germans. I mean, it's ironic that everybody says it's the Germans, and that's because the Germans are the most successful. They have the balance sheet, they have the wallet, and everybody says, well, if only they had the will. But there's a reason why the Germans are hesitant. And, and I always tell my colleagues, ask why is someone rational acting in a way that seems irrational to you? And I think the Germans understand that you need at least five elements of a solution, five. One is the Germans need to decide what they want the Eurozone to look like. Do they want it to be a full fiscal union, which is another way of thinking of what West Germany did for East Germany, which is this is a political decision. This is not an economic decision. This is a political decision, but we need to do it. Or does Germany want a smaller and less imperfect Eurozone? That is Germany's decision. Secondly, we need actions to reconcile two very different priorities in the periphery. One is to contain debt, and the other one is to grow. Remember, solvency has a numerator and a denominator. The numerator is how much debt you have to pay. The, the denominator is your ability to pay. And so far, the periphery has not met that balance. Third, we need to counter the fragilities of the banking system. The banks have become a problem on a standalone basis. They're no longer just the recipient of the sovereign debt crisis. They are now a source of disruptions that's going to get worse unless that's countered. Fourth, we need the ECB to be convinced that it can play a major role as a circuit breaker. As you know, markets tend to be self-fulfilling. The more they worry, the, the worse the outcome. The worse the outcome, the more they worry. So you need a circuit breaker. And only the ECB can be 
that circuit breaker. Right, but, but I'm going to stop you there. All right, well, give us number five, and then I've got a couple of quick questions. No, no, go questions. ahead. Well, no, no, you, go you, ahead. I mean, you, you were talking about the ECB. Uh, you, you suggested my question, frankly, was a bit simplistic. I, I take the point. But in the end, issues like whether the ECB is going to be unleashed to, to be the lender of last resort to really uh, open itself up to rescue some of these countries, it comes back to Germany, does it not? And in a way, I just want a simple emotional response from you, whether you think Germany acting in concert with the French and the other Europeans can do what is necessary. Oh, they can if they're convinced that others will also do their part. I, I think it's important to ask the question why two years after the ECB, the IMF and the EU stepped in dramatically to save Greece, every single indicator in Greece is worse. Every single one. Okay, not just relative to where they were two years ago, relative to the expectation of the policymakers. There's a reason for that, which is the ECB, the IMF, can only provide liquidity. Liquidity is a bridge, but if there's no destination on the other side of that bridge, that liquidity becomes wasted. And I think the ECB has realized that over the last two years, it has been doing things that has only contaminated its balance sheet. So the ECB is saying, look, I am willing to play, I'm willing to engage, but I need other people to engage as well. I cannot be the only player in this game. But because if I'm the only player in this game, everybody's worse off. But when you talk about the situation in Greece getting worse, that also raises another sort of economic philosophical question in my mind. I mean, do you think that Europe right now is overplaying austerity, so preoccupied with austerity that it's forgetting that actually this crisis can only be ended when real growth is being delivered and in the current climate it's very hard to see where growth in Greece or Portugal or even Italy is going to come from. Oh absolutely and I would say the same thing also of other countries. We faced four distinct problems. One is too much debt in the West. We fell in love with leverage. We fell in love with this notion of credit entitlement, that you could buy things on credit, and now we have to pay it back, or we have to impose losses. Second, we're not growing enough. We have tremendous structural impediments to growth, and we're not doing enough to deal with it. We are yet to see any serious structural reforms, either in Europe or in the United States. M policymakers are stuck in a cyclical mindset. What they need is a structural and secular mindset. This is hard work, and they need to start. Well, then, uh, Third, let me, they, just just some quick, quick fire responses from you on some particular situations we see. Let me start here at home in London, where I speak to you from, with the UK government, which has just uh, given its latest budget forecasts, which are extraordinarily bleak. It now looks like six years of consistent austerity coming from the, from the British government. Do you think they've got the calibration of economic policy wrong? I think on the whole they got it almost right. I would like to see a little bit more structural reforms and the Chancellor's speech this week went a little bit towards that but he could do more. But I think they understand that being a small country looking at storms as it was called, storms coming from Europe and another storm that will come from the US at some point, that they understand that they don't have the luxury of the United States, they don't have the luxury of being a large economy with a reserve currency. So I think what Britain is doing is understandable. It's not pleasant, but it's understandable. And a, fi a final thought on the particular European situation right now. I was very taken with words from Jacques Attali, the French economist, former head of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, who said that he believed there was a 50-50 chance the euro could break down, could unravel by Christmas. How would you characterize the chances of that happening? I think he's very, he's very right to be worried. I think if we don't see some meaningful action in the run-up and at the December 9th European summit, the chances that he's citing are correct. But Europe still controls its destiny. But Europe is going to have to make one of two difficult choices, either opt for the full fiscal union or opt for a smaller and less imperfect Eurozone. It needs to make that decision. Well, here, here's a left-field thought for you. Do you think if this, the crisis deepens over the next few days and weeks, as you've indicated, you believe it well might, should the US government step in at some point and use its enormous economic power to do what is necessary to shore up uh, this massive sovereign debt crisis in Europe? That's a great question. Um, the US is playing a supportive role. It could play an even more supportive role. 
in, by coordinating this orchestra that has no conductor, right? I mean, the European crisis is happening partly because there is no global conductor. So everybody's stepping back rather than engaging. But I think the solution is in the hands of the European. The U.S. can, can support the solution, can, can help coordinate, but it cannot impose a solution. But on the other hand, Obama knows that if Europe does go, quote unquote, belly up, there's going to be a massive consequence for the United States. You, for sure, will be going right back into recession, if not depression. And I just wonder, you know, uh, Michael Bloomberg used these words the other day of the situation in the United States, uh, of, of your own terrible problems. You call them political problems over the budget and, and sorting out your budget. He said, cowardice and partisanship in Washington is right now really hurting our country. Would you agree with that? I would absolutely agree. First, I would say you cannot be a good house in a bad neighborhood. So if Europe goes down, if the global economy goes into a recession, everybody's going to feel it. The U.S. is politically dysfunctional. Okay, and that's why we can't agree, we can't come to the center. Not only are the Democrats and the Republicans far apart, but the popular, populist movements are pulling them further apart. So the Tea Party is, falling, is, is pulling the Republicans further to the right, the Occupy movement is pulling the Democrats further to the left. What we need in the U.S. is what we've called here a Sputnik moment, a realization that unless we come together with a common vision and common purpose, things are going to get a lot worse. All right, well, let, let's put your cards on the table. The specifics that the two parties are arguing over when it comes to the budget and the dealing with the deficit are whether it is right to extend the Bush tax cuts. As part of any deficit-cutting program, the Re Republicans insist that there has to be an extension of the tax cuts, the tax breaks, including for the richest Americans. Obama says, no, that is not acceptable in this particular hour of need. Where do you sit on that debate in brief? I think President Obama is absolutely right. I think everybody has to contribute. This is a shared responsibility with shared sacrifices. And the rich have been doing extremely well in the United States over the last number of years. And I would not extend the tax breaks. All right. Well, some more quick fire things then that take us around the world a little bit more. Just strikes me that when you and I talk about the state of the world economy, I sit in London, you sit in California, we both talk about uh, a sort of doomsday scenario, maybe we're missing one particular point, and that is if we were watching this in Beijing, Shanghai, Delhi, or a whole host of other cities in the emerging economy world, we'd be saying these guys are way too pessimistic because overall growth across the world this year is going to be between, I think, 3 and 4% growth. You know, not a contraction, but real growth in many parts of the world. Can that continue if we're right about what's happening in the industrialized world? 